Good evening and welcome to the Ordinal Data section of the 2022 Boulder Workshop. My name is Brad Verhals from Texas A&M University and I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the fundamental components of ordinal data and why ordinal data analysis is so integral to our understanding of the statistical processes for many uh, behavioral traits. And before I start, I'd like to thank Fruling Rickstad, Sarah Medland, Mike Neal, and all of those people who have come before me to give similar lectures at previous Boulder workshops, because I'm really building on a lot of that information in this uh, presentation. So the analysis of ordinal data is a very essential component to most behavioral traits. Um, and so today, what we're going to focus on is providing an intuitive sense of how we estimate correlations from ordinal data and binary data in particular. We're going to introduce the concept of the liability threshold model and why that's so important for understanding ordinal uh, data analysis. And then we're going to provide a mathematical description of the model. And just fair warning, there's going to be some uh, calculus in this and we're gonna go through it and it's really gonna make a lot of sense to you afterwards why we needed to use some of these scary integral signs and such. So let's start with why do we care about ordinal data? Well, most of the time when we're thinking about how we collect data in psychology and psychiatry and many of the behavioral sciences, we often measure the behaviors using a limited number of ordinal categories. So things like the absence or presence of a disorder, the severity of a disorder, mild, moderate, or severe, the score on a Likert item, none, some, lots, agree, slightly disagree, you know, all of those kind of things. Or we count the number of symptoms that people have and treat those as ordinal. Of course, that's not necessarily the base, best case because symptoms may actually come from a Poisson distribution, which uh, deviates from what we're really talking about here. But nevertheless, it's better to treat them as ordinal than as continuous. And the, and the reason for this session really comes down to the fact that ordinal data requires different statistical methods than continuous data. And we're gonna start walking through what those methods are and why they're so important in just a few seconds. So the problem with treating binary variables as continuous is relatively obvious. Most of the time we want to assume that there's a normal distribution underlying the variables, but with ordinal data and especially binary data, this is obviously wrong. So in this figure, we can see two traits, sorry, two categories that are either zeros or ones. But if we assume that they're continuous, we can see that these traits don't, this trait doesn't follow a normal distribution. And because the distribution of the trait doesn't follow a normal distribution, it's impossible for the error terms to follow a normal distribution. So what happens when we use continuous methods on binary variables? And this is perhaps the simplest case of what happens when we, when we use the wrong methods to, to, analyze, um, to analyze binary variables. So instead of using polychoric or tetrachoric correlations, people are often tempted to use a straight up product moment correlation or con continuous various variable methods like linear regression. And so what I did with Mike in a publication that we had last year uh, in the special issue on statistical methods for, for twin studies is we simulated data to have a correlation of about 0.7. And then we chopped that data up into two categories, three categories, four categories, five categories, et cetera, down the line, all the way up to 15 categories. And then what we did was we either analyzed the data correctly using a polychoric or tetrachoric correlation or incorrectly using a Pearson correlation or a zero order correlation or product mode, whatever you wanna call it. So what we can see here is on the top, right where we simulated the, the, the correlation, we're recovering 
the observed correlation matches the simulated correlation as long as we use um, the, the proper ordinal correlation. If instead we use a Pearson correlation, what we see here is the Pearson correlation always underestimates the correlation. And the fewer the categories, so if you've got two categories, for example, you're gonna underestimate that correlation substantially more than if you've got more. But note that even as we approach the number of categories, we never quite get up to the level of the primary uh, simulated correlation. The difference between the light and blue or dark blue and the red or pink boxes here are whether the in blue, the, the data was symmetrically um, categorized. So you've got equal numbers of individuals in each category, or if it was asymmetric, so that you've got a disproportionate number in the affected categories. So when we, when we, when we see this, we can see that the correlations, if they're done using continuous variable methods, are never going to approach the um, approach the tr true correlation. But when we've got binary variables, as we've got in this case here, and, and that case lines up with this green line right here, what we can see is that as the prevalence of the trait decreases from equal numbers of people that are affected or unaffected or a prevalence of about 0.5, we see a constant decline in the correlation such that by the time that we get to the 20% prevalence or whatnot, we're starting to see a rather stark decrease in the observed correlation. So even though we started simulating um, the correlation at 0.7, in the best case scenario, when we have equal levels of, of affected and unaffected, we're still getting a correlation somewhere just south of 0.5. And as the prevalence declines from there, by the time we get to about 0.2, we're in that 0.4 range. And by the time we get to a 5% prevalence, we're way down in the 0.25 range, which is almost a third of the magnitude of the simulated correlation. And if we don't wanna just throw away those correlations, we need to start modeling this uh, ordinal and binary data properly. So how do we do that? So there's two primary ways about thinking about binary dependent variables. And the first one is that we assume that the observed binary variable is indicative of an underlying latent or unobservable continuous normally distributed variable. And we call that unobserved latent continuous variable the liability. The second way of thinking about binary dependent variables is to assume that the binary variable is a random draw from a Bernoulli or binomial distribution, which requires us to look at nonlinear probability models. And, and we can derive the same model out of both assumptions. The difference is that if we use the second assumption, the Bernoulli distribution, there's a lot more math and it's a lot more complicated. And since it gets us to the same place, then we can derive it using the liability, uh, the, the liability threshold model, and that's gonna be much easier to demonstrate. The second very good reason to, um, to use this liability threshold model is it extends to multiple thresholds much easier than the, than the Bernoulli derivation. Okay, so let's progress assuming that our binary variable is indicative of an underlying latent continuous normally distributed variable. In that case, we have to make a few assumptions um, about what those numbers actually mean. So the first assumption is that the categories that we're observing are zeros or ones or affected or unaffected are reflecting an imprecise measurement of the underlying normally distributed liability. The liability is thought to be influencing, influenced by many things such as genetic or environmental factors. Each of these effects, however, is so minuscule that if you measured it, it would basically not do anything at all. It would just slightly nudge 
the, the mean of that individual's uh, behavior up or down just slightly. And the central limit theorem then predicts that the variation should be normally distributed. Um, and, and that's just one of the tenets of, of the normal distribution and the, and the central limit theorem. So the second assumption that we're gonna make is that the liability distribution has one or more thresholds. Let's start with one, we'll build more in as we go along, but one seems like a good place to start. So the fundamental aspects of the liability threshold model then are we have an underlying liability towards a behavior, say uh, a psychopathology, then we have a normal distribution of that of that uh, behavior in the population, of the liability towards that behavior in the population. And we're gonna draw a threshold at a particular value. So this threshold or tau here suggests that anything less than the threshold is gonna be observed as a zero. And anything more than that threshold is going to be a one. So if we think about it as the blue section here is our cases and the and the on the blank section here is our controls we can clearly see how this would apply to psychiatric phenotypes so what are the ideas behind the liability threshold model so we only observe the binary outcomes the affected or unaffected but we know that people can be more or less effective so even if you are a case you can be a really extreme case you can be a mild case or you could actually be a case, but on that day you were feeling pretty good. And the day that you got measured, you were just sub threshold. But maybe if a bad thing happens to you, you're gonna be a case again. And so, so there is some error in our assessment of whether or not you're a case or a control. Since the variables, since the liability to the variable is latent and therefore we can't directly observe it, we can't estimate the means and the variances like we can for continuous variables. And therefore we have to make a few assumptions about them. Um, we, have to, we have to basically say, hey, we're gonna pretend that the mean and the variance are some arbitrary value. And the specifics of that don't really matter, but we have to make some sort of assumptions. So what kind of assumptions should we make? Well, there's three classes of assumptions that we need to make. We need to make an assumption about the mean, we need to make an assumption about the variance, and we need to make an assumption about the residuals. So the mean assumption is basically that we can either fix the intercept or the mean to zero, or we can fix one of the thresholds to zero. And basically all that does is put it on a standard normal or a, an augmented normal distribution. Um, Either of these two assumptions provide equivalent model fit. And the intercept is simply a transformation of the threshold. And so if your threshold, for example, if you fix the mean to zero and your threshold is negative one, that would be equivalent to fixing the threshold to zero and estimating a mean of one. And you can see that you can transform back and forth without loss of any kind of information whatsoever. The second assumption is the variance assumption. And basically what we're saying is the variance of the error term given our model X is equal to either one, if we're gonna use the normal OGIVE model as our standard normal distribution as our underlying distribution, which is equivalent to the probit regression model or the probit model. And this is what we're gonna do in OpenMX. Alternatively, we can fit uh, we can fix the the variance of the of the ordinal trait to pi squared divided by three, which puts it on a logit scale. And this is what is assumed to happen at the logit model. And what really happens here is that the logit and the probit models, while there's slight differences in the tails of the distributions, come to basically the same results. Um, it doesn't really matter which assumption that you make. Um, but we need to make some assumption about what the variance is. And the final assumption that we have to make is the residual variance assumption. And basically what we're saying here is that the conditional mean of the error term is zero given the model. 
And this basically means that there's no bias in our parameter estimates. And this is the same assumption that we make for continuous variables. Um, so this is something that that's, that's pretty standard. Okay. So we've made assumptions about the ordinal associations. And it's important to reiterate that the assumptions that we've made are arbitrary. The same model can be specified in several different ways and the parameters that we estimate will be different things will be different values, but the negative two log likelihood should be approximately the same for models that are just, should be exactly the same for models that are transformations of each other. If you're making slight differences in the, in the estimates of the variance, then um, there will be slight differences in the model fit, but those model fit differences are, 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 are typically very trivial. These arbitrary assumptions, however, are absolutely necessary because we don't directly measure this latent liability. We have no information about the means or its variances and the thresholds could expand or contract, think something akin to an accordion to compensate for any kind of change in variance. So we have to make some sort of, of, of assumption about the variation and the means but which ones we do are, are pretty much arbitrary. So what does this threshold mean? So in the binary case, this threshold is just a z-score and really can be interpreted as such. So if we look at this blue shaded area here, what we see is that we've got the integral or the area under the curve here from the threshold to positive infinity. Right, And so what we see here is we've got the integral from Z threshold up to infinity is gonna follow a normal distribution for the likelihood differentiated with respect to the, the likelihood. And basically this means that if the threshold is negative 0.65, sorry, negative 1.65, then 5% of the distribution is gonna to be to the left of this threshold and 95% of the distribution the area under the curve is going to be to the right of the threshold. So if we had a thousand people, 50 people would fall over here and 950 would fall in this blue shaded area. Alternatively, if this threshold was 1.96, right? So over in this area here, then 97 and a half percent of the distribution would be to the left of it and two and a half percent would be to the right of it. So if we had a thousand people, 97, not 975 would be over here and 25 would be over here. Obviously where the threshold is, is going to determine how many people are unaffected and affected respectively. So when we're talking about twin models, we're no longer talking about univariate kind of methods, we're immediately jumping into bivariate or multivariate methods. And so we can represent the correlations in terms of a contingency table. So we can think of twin one and twin two as being unaffected and affected or affected and unaffected for twin two. And then we can see that cell A here is the concordant unaffected twins, twin pairs, Cell D is the concordant affected twin pairs, and C and B are the discordant affected unaffected twin pairs. So when we start thinking about the liability in a multivariate space, in a bivariate space in this case, the bivariate normal distribution starts to take a different shape depending on the correlation between the two traits. So in this case, when the correlation is zero, we see just a mound here. The shape of the distribution looks, looks um, fairly low and, and, and spread out. Whereas if we've got a correlation of 0.9, we see almost a knife edge here. So almost all of the data falls along this one diagonal dimension effectively. So when we push this forward to say a twin model, when we're looking for affected and unaffected using a, a, a liability threshold framework, we can see that the unaffected unaffected 
twin pairs are going to take this section over here. So everyone up to threshold one and everyone up to threshold two is going to be in this double unaffected case. By contrast, everybody over both thresholds, so twin one exceeds the threshold and twin two exceeds the threshold, so they're both cases, is going to fall in this section of the distribution here. And our discordant twin pairs are going to get these two sections here. So when we think about this, we can really start carving up this, this bivariate distribution into very accessible points. And so when we calculate the cell proportions, what we're going to do is we're going to integrate over the bivariate normal distribution across two liability dimensions. So if, we, if we're looking for the probability that twins are both above the threshold, we're going to integrate from the threshold to positive infinity for twin one and the threshold to positive infinity for twin two. And that's what we're going to see right here. Of course, we've got several other possibilities. So we've got the concordant unaffected is just from negative infinity to the threshold for both twins or from negative infinity to the threshold and then from the threshold to positive infinity for the discordant pairs. So they're both falling into different sections here of the, of the bivariate normal distribution. Since the bivariate normal distribution is a known mathematical distribution, each correlation or sigma is known for any set of thresholds. And we know what those cell proportions are going to be. And therefore, the observed cell proportions from our data will give us the correlations and the thresholds for each liability. So if we had, for example, 87% of the distribution falling into the unaffected, unaffected situation, 10% split evenly between the discordant twin pairs, and 3% falling into the um, concordant affected twin pairs, we would assume we would be able to calculate a correlation, a tetracorp correlation in this case, of 0.6, where the two twin thresholds were um, equal to 0.4. And those are just done on a standard normal distribution. So the 0.4 is really a Z score. But of course, a lot of times we measure things on an ordinal scale, not just a binary scale. And this can really increase the power to detect um, significant associations as we increase the number of, of um, categories here. But fundamentally, the idea of the liability threshold model remains the same. So in this case, we've got four thresholds, and so we've got five category values. The liability distribution is still quite similar, and we can simply translate anything less than tau one is going to get a zero between tau one and tau two is going to get a one and et cetera, et cetera. And the interpretation of the multiple threshold liability model is equivalent to the single threshold liability model or the standard liability threshold model. But once we have additional thresholds, we can start playing around with the assumptions. So, um, when we start thinking about more sophisticated models like the latent growth model, we really care a lot more about the means and the variances of the underlying latent uh, distribution than we did um, with a simple uh, twin model or something like that. Um, and in these cases, it makes a lot more sense to think about means and variances than it, than it does to fix the, the mean of the distribution to zero and start estimating our thresholds. And so what we can do here is, is we know that we can either estimate the intercept or a threshold. And so in this case, we're going to estimate the mean and fix the threshold one at zero. Um, and if we've got two or more thresholds, we can also estimate the variance. Um, and this is a slightly different identification assumption, but the model fit remained the same. And that's really the key thing is that we're not actually changing anything about our model fit. It's estimating the same model, but the interpretation of the parameters becomes more reasonable and more, on, more consistent with what we'd expect from continuous types of models. So basically, 
when we're estimating this model, we're fixing tau one to zero, which just shifts the whole numbers uh, to the left. Um, we're fixing the distance between tau one and tau two to a arbitrary value, one. Zeros and ones are really easy to work with. And then we can freely estimate the mean, but we can also freely estimate tau three and tau four, and that can help resolve other types of issues, like, for example, differences in um, the measurement of the underlying li liability dimension across multiple groups. So in twin models, the correlations and the liabilities can be estimated separately for the different MZ and DZ twin pair types. And then we can decompose the variance into A, C, and E, just the same as we would when we had continuous variables. But the difference is that we're decomposing the liability of the trait rather than the observed values of the trait. And the correlations and the liabilities then are determined by the path model in the same methods that you would for continuous variables. But we would interpret the heritability of the liability rather than the heritability of the observed variable. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any additional questions, we will be available during the session to answer them for you. I look forward to meeting you then. <laughs>